Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us tonight for this installment of Blunt Talks at the Weed Maps Museum of Weed. As a quick reminder, please remember to set your phones to vibrate or silent if you haven't done so already. As a reminder, there is no the smoking allowed in indoors, so, so please, please do ask that you refrain from smoking of any form or kind or vaporizing as well. Now, it is my honor to introduce your hosts for this evening, Nicole West and Sam Zartoshti. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this is actually a really big for all of us here at Blood. amazing place for the history of marijuana to be talked about. Um, if you guys haven't gotten a chance to go through the museum, I would highly recommend that you do. Uh, we are looking at probably another week, I think I've heard, before it's closed. Um, this is probably one of the more amazing curated events that I've even gotten to go to. So what do you think, Sam? I agree. Yeah, no, I'm, we're really, really stoked about this opportunity. So thank you, Weed Maps. Huge thank you. Um, not only for helping me find my weed forever, but also for helping us, you know, show the cannabis history and be able to get things out there to kind of break those stigmas down um, and also see how far we've come over, what, what was the first artifact in there? It was like 2,000 years, I think they say, before Prohibition. Um, it's a really exciting day for all of us. So we have some really amazing speakers for you. And actually, if you guys aren't familiar with Blunt Talks, is this your, someone raise your hand, everyone raise your hand if this is your first Blunt Talks. Oh my God, that's amazing. Thank you okay. for coming. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also, let's raise your hand if you've been to two Blunt Talks. What about three Blunt Talks? Four, five, six, oh, five, five Blunt we have some of the people that have been here to five lunch, which we are really freaking excited about. Thank you so much for participating in what we are doing. Um, but also, come to our next one. We are going to be having another event coming in January. We're pretty excited about it as well. Um, but nothing like this. Nothing like being able to be a part of history. Um, so we actually invite up somebody who is the vice president um, at Weed Maps right now. We had, originally, we had someone who was going to come from the government relations, but now we just got the vice president of the company. Um, actually, I don't know if he's here. Oh, yep, you are here. Come on up. Sam, if you want to give him your microphone. We are very excited. Mr. Felicio, thank you so much. Thanks very much, everybody. Hi, everyone. My name is Carl Felicio. How many people here is this the first? How many have been here before? Excellent. Uh, a little correction from what you heard. Uh, lucky. Uh, we're packing up on Sunday. Sunday is day. Um, what? What? I'm getting you a new mic. No, no, it's fine. I, I, I can. Can you hear me now, too? OK. All right, Sunday is our actually last day, whole, you know, uh, TBD, where it's going to go next. We have had a pretty marvelous time here. Um, uh, we opened three months ago. In that time, uh, thousands of people have come in and learned about uh, the amazing plant, its history, its benefits. Um, and even more people have come in the evening for events like this. Um, we posted... Uh, California State Treasurer Anna Ma, who's talked about taxation and uh, cannabis. We have hosted uh, veterans and PTSD uh, forums. We had a unbelievable symposium on social equity. And um, last night, it was a huge privilege for me to co-moderate a discussion examining the role that cannabis played in the long-term health and happiness of long-term AIDS survivors. Uh, which was a really emotional and uh, educational experience and really something where, you know, folks from, you know, 20, 30 years ago who actually visited Dennis Perone's uh, dispensary that's on display here actually came back and saw it and it was really something. Um, the person who has birthed this place and made it great and uh, was with it 
at every moment of its existence and will be a big part of its future is um, my friend and my colleague, Madeline Donegan, and I would like you to give her a big hand and I want to give her, I want her to come up here because I want to give her a big hug. Okay. This is uh, her baby. This is uh, what she did. This is the uh, a, a great example of the power of what we can do together to tell this amazing story. I, uh, I'm looking really forward to listening to the, uh, the presentations tonight, and uh, it is really a, a, a great honor for me to welcome all of you here today and, and to be a part of a, a great experience that will continue. Thanks very much. Have a great night. Well, I actually am really excited to be in this museum. And one of the biggest things for me personally is I used to work at Weed Maps. Uh, back in 2012, I was a sales rep and helped me at a time in my life that I had essentially lost everything. Um, I was a paid customer of Weed Maps. I was actually one of the first few paid customers of Weed Maps. When they called me the first time, they flipped us over from a free account to a paid account, told them, I'm not paying you. Well, when I didn't get any new patients the next day, I called with my tail between my legs shortly after that, and I asked them if I, 295 got me a listing, what's 600 bucks gonna give me? And I've been working in partnership with Weed Maps in an opportunity to be able to provide medicine to patients for over 10 years now, and I'm so thankful for the ability, not only as a patient, for me to find my but also as a purveyor, somebody who has helped build businesses in the cannabis industry. Weed Maps has done some amazing things for cannabis and helped this progression of this industry in such an amazing way that I personally am honored to stand on this stage and say thank you, Weed Maps, for giving us this opportunity. The museum would like to say thank you to all of you and everyone for coming out to be a part of this. Um, I wanted to wait until you guys got a chance to see the amazing Madeline. She has been just a breath of fresh air in this space, and I am just so thankful for this opportunity. Um, I actually was able to get this opportunity because of uh, somebody who was my coworker at Weed Maps. Her name is Candy, and she still works there today. Candy, if you where are you? Round of applause for Miss Candy. Oh, she's over here. My, my girl, this girl right here, thank you for making the introduction and giving us this opportunity. So if you guys see Madeline or Candy uh, going around tonight, because it really means a lot to have all of you here. Um, and, and again, it it's, means a lot for me to be able to find my weed. So thank you, Weed Maps. Um, I'm actually going to do, next introduce our uh, first speaker. And our first speaker is somebody who I was introduced to through um, somebody who's special to me, Dr. Dina, and Dr. Dina introduced me to Peachy, and I have just been in love with this woman ever since. She is probably one of the more high energy humans I have ever been able to vibrate next to, and it is just so amazing to be a part of her life. Um, she is a decorated veteran whose relationship with cannabis goes back to 1977. Never in her wildest dreams did she think she would be winding in the support of the end of cannabis prohibition. She's the author of the Queen of Stones Oracle Card Deck and the Wellness Disruptor. And she's your favorite stoner's favorite stoner. You think she's just Wiz Khalifa's mama, but you'll find out that he didn't fall too far from the peach tree. Miss Peachy Wimbush Polk, we'd love to have you come on up. <clears throat> oh, yeah, we got a good mic. <laughs> I think I'm gonna sit, um, yeah, right here is good. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you, Weed Museum. Oh, 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 sorry. Thank you, each and every one of you guys. Sorry, I'm a little bit klutzy. He got that from me as well. <laughs> if somebody could help me up on this chair, yeah, and then help me bumper. Bumper right there, yep, yep. Okay, I think I'm ready. Yes. <laughs> I am so grateful for each and every one of you. 
and every hand, big and small, for tonight. Imagine having one of those life-changing moments where nothing is ever the same afterward. I grew up a very girly girl in the historic Hill District neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You were looking at a grown-up version of that little girl from the project. I had a happy child's encounter with a recruiter my senior year. I now know that there are no chance encounters. Everything is divinely designed. We are exactly where we need to be for our next growth spurt. I secretly enlisted in the Air Force as a munition system specialist. Yeah, I say it secretly because, like I said, I was on my way to college. Yep, I built maintained bombs. I retrained to surgical services the moment I could because I was looking at the long game and retirement from explosive ordnance just didn't seem like, you know, um, any fun. At least now, if I blew you up, I could put you back together. Never in my wildest dreams did I believe that my kids could legitimately get teased that their mama wore combat boots. <laughs> Eight years, eight months, eight days. I discovered that service is my superpower. Who am I to sit here before you today? I am a decorated U.S. Air Force veteran. I am a fairy godmother and conscious badass. Think Glenda the Good Witch, trained in takedown maneuvers. I'm a wife four times. Don't judge me, I was born the same day as Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> I'm a teacher, an author, a griot, a closet comedian, mentor, self-sufficiency expert, and wellness disruptor, and mother of two. My claim to fame is being mommy to the superstar that is Wiz Khalifa, an OG, that's my grandmother name, to my yummy grandson, Sebastian. Life two divorces and underemployment led me back to Pittsburgh, PA in 1996. It came with the dual benefit of giving my military-born children, who aren't from anywhere, some roots. Community was vital to molding me. And I wanted the same thing for my kids. It worked out, it worked out big time. Yeah, uh-huh, you know what it is. Black and yellow, black and yellow. I've survived a fall from a second-story window before my first birthday, a ruptured appendix, spinal meningitis, war, domestic violence, being widowed, welfare, PTSD, depression, bankruptcy, health crises, being separated from my family voluntarily and involuntarily, a 150-pound dog attack to my face, employment in a maximum security men's penitentiary, and if you don't think that's scary, be a woman that works deep in the belly of the beast. Addiction, discrimination, and all the common isms like racism, sexism, and classism. I thank God I said I don't look like what I've been through, and I'm thinking that I'm not the only one in this group that that is true for. I got two calls that I thought I would never survive. Remember I asked you to imagine that life-altering moment? Mine happened in July 2016. I was about six weeks post-op from having my broken foot repaired. It was a home show. Home shows are always the best shows because Pittsburgh shows up and turns out for his sons and daughters who are on display doing anything. Pittsburgh fans are infamous. Wiz Khalifa and Snoop Dogg descend on Pittsburgh to a sold-out crowd. On show days, my, husband, my hubby and I, we usually get to the venue by early afternoon so I can get in front of traffic um, and also spend as much time with my baby boy Sunshine as possible. I had over 100 people on my personal guest list, which meant the prospect of lots of calls and text messages to the main gate to iron out this issue or that issue. 
Because I was recovering from foot surgery and still using a cane to walk, this was going to be more than a notion. But in the end, like Ice Cube say, it was a good day. My oldest, Dorian, who we affectionately refer to as Lala, phoned me around 5 p.m. with what I thought was a request for a ride to the venue. The actual ask was for me to help get the cat situated and boarded so she could check into a nursing home for hospice care. Wait, 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 wait a minute, what? what? You just don't check into a nursing home like it's a hotel, but Lala was 32 and, you know, how would a 32-year-old know? I don't remember the rest of the night. I didn't even share with anyone that I had gotten that call, but my whole universe was blown. Long story short, Lala had been diagnosed with lymphoma in 2010 and decided because of mistrust of the medical community to ignore it. It happens in, in our community for people that look like me. It was a major source of disagreement for us because in no uncertain way did I have it in me to watch my kid die. The tumors were pressing on her spine and she could no longer walk. After 45 days of hospitals, and nursing homes, Lala was discharged home in the care of hospice service, services and eventually 24-hour round-the-clock care. Hospice care is end-of-life care. It was clear as a crystal ball for me. The second call, which I spent every moment after the first call waiting for, came on the morning of February 19th. 2017 from Lala's living caregiver. The first person to know my heartbeat from inside passed away very peacefully the following morning, exactly seven days before my birthday. It was just us, like in the beginning. I felt like I would die myself. I was in what felt like a fog of pain and grief. I even bargained with goddess, take me instead of my child. I was confused and afraid that my blown to shred heart would never be whole again, just a hole. I became an empty shell of myself going through the next few months on autopilot. To say I was not looking forward to the first anniversary of everything is an understatement. As Labor Day approached, I got a text message from Cameron's assistant asking that I submit a one to two minute clip to be used in a tribute video for his 30th birthday. For a woman who prides herself on adapting and adjusting to most any situation, and always having words, I was unsure if I could rise to this. Not only was it a milestone birthday, it was a glaring concrete reminder that Lala would not have a birthday on that upcoming Halloween. How could I offer anything when I felt so empty inside? What OG nugget of wisdom could I bestow on my surviving child? I sat with the fear of having nothing for a few days. It was during a reflective meditation that I heard what seemed like an angel's voice. Tell him to be careful with his power and be careless with his magic. The bigger boom was that I understood that this message was also for me that's what makes me sure it was heaven sent. Your power is your sphere of influence. Those people, places, things that you have control over. It can be mental, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual. And we all are born with it. And it's evident in our relationship with other people. Why do I warn you to be careful with your power? Because it comes with immense responsibility. 
we all have our own personal power or what I like to call inherent power. And it's developed based on our experiences, healthy or unhealthy. We are certainly not taught about our power and meander through life trying to figure it out. In this present environment of Time's Up and Me Too movements, we are bearing witness to what abuse of power looks like. I get asked all the time to turn my sunshine's attention to one thing or another. It doesn't matter what the thing is. The very nature of that ask assumes that I will abuse my power in our relationship to advance their cause. I'm his mother. He naturally doesn't want to tell me no. I don't want to tell my mommy no. So I don't give him any reason to. And I'd like to encourage you, if you want something from someone, don't piggyback off of the power dynamic that is already established by somebody else. Try developing a relationship of your own and, um, with that person, and then you ask them. We've come a long way, but we still have much work ahead of us. Another power dynamic that we totally sleep is willpower. For Lala, that meant the will to die on her own terms. For me, it meant the will to honor those terms when I had literal power of attorney to do whatever I felt was best. Please believe I had selfish motives, but I was able to get over myself, and I thank God as that I did. I had to harness my willpower, so I began to live again. I believe willpower is one of the most authentic powers because it's rooted in deep love for something, even if it's just yourself. And finally, that second nugget of wisdom, be careless with your magic. What is this magic that I keep on insisting that you have and I have and everybody has? It is everything you've done right. It is all of the good in you. It's your compassion. It's your empathy. It's your love for this cannabis community and its expansion done right. It's your light. It's whatever higher power you ascribe to in you. It's grace, but for God is there go I. And I don't want you to forget that it's in abundant supply because it's in your essence. So sprinkle that shit everywhere. <clears throat> I heard someone say recently, the best, the best version of yourself is alive. And it hit me like fireworks. The human spirit is indestructible if you choose. Dun, 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 dun. The fact that I get to live in my purpose is nothing short of a miracle and pure magic. I'm grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Peachy. We really appreciate you coming out here and speaking. And um, our next speaker is someone that he's actually done a blunt talk in the past. He did a blunt talk about a year and a half ago. Where am I supposed to stand? So he did a blunt talk about a year and a half ago, and um, it was probably one of the best blunt talks that we've had, and a lot of people have requested that he comes back, and he's been a really busy guy, so it's kind of been hard to, uh, to get him back. But um, this is someone that, let me just uh, run back to my notes really quick, but um, he's been cultivating cannabis for 37 years. Um, it's a little bit longer than I've been alive, to be honest with you guys, and probably longer than some of the other people in the audience have been alive. Um, he's known for traveling the world and teaching others his cultivation techniques and his breeding techniques and really just sharing the genetics that he's created. And um, he's just done a lot of epic stuff in his career. And I think he's going to go over how he, um, how he got his name, 
But um, if you don't know his name, you should know it. And um, yeah, I'm proud to introduce Kyle Cushman. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. And thank you, Blunt Talks and Weed Maps, for having me. Um, and uh, so, uh, wow, this is really uh, an amazing night for me. I have a lot of friends in the audience. And besides that, there's just a lot of love in the audience. Um, this is a great venue to talk in. And, um, you know, for a glorified high school pot dealer like myself, to be standing up here and to get to give you some of my perspectives on the last 30 almost 31 years of cultivating marijuana. Yeah, I'm an oldie. This is my 31st year cultivating marijuana. Thank you very much. And that's without a felony. So, not that there haven't been bumps along the way and everything. Um, my journey started in upstate New York. That's where I'm from. And uh, when I started, you could catch 10 years for growing some plants like, like nothing. And uh, <laughs> the last time I counted, I think I'm on my 32nd or my 33rd address since I left home at 16. And that's because uh, I moved basically every six to nine months to stay ahead of the cops. Now, back then, you know, probably, I probably was a lot safer than I thought I was because not many people knew that you'd be in a house in a nondescript neighborhood just growing weed in a bedroom. Um, but the feeling you get when you come home and it's the middle of January and every house in the neighborhood has 18 inches of snow on the roof and yours doesn't have any snow on the roof because you're growing in the attic... You know, it's like, hey, it's time to move again, you know? So, um, let's just say that, that uh, all that moving leads to a lot of appreciation, you know? Um, so, spontaneity leads me to talk about, um, before I left New York, I was lucky enough to walk into a head shop. We still call them head shops, right? Right? Okay. Okay. I walked into a head shop called Not Fade Away Tie-Dye in New Paltz, New York. And uh, the owner shared a joint with me. And uh, I decided to reciprocate. So when we were done, I pulled out my bag and I showed him the bud. And honest to God, he had a Roger Rabbit moment. His eyes bulged out of his head. And he's like, where did you get that? And I said, I'm just growing over the Shawangung Cliffs. You know? And he was like, wow, did you, you ever want to meet high times? And I'm thinking... Well, I got eight years at home in binders. I've been reading them forever. It'd be pretty cool to meet somebody from High Times. So, you know, I, in a friendly meeting, I met somebody from High Times and uh, shared my weed with them. And I became a hit. I became a hit in the office. And uh, that's kind of how I got my name. Because uh, the, uh, the secretary at the time, Anne Marie, uh, the receptionist, I'd get off the elevator and and she'd get on the intercom and she'd say, the Cushman is here, the Cushman is here. Meet in Harry Crossfield's office. And uh, they'd all file down the office, down to the office, and they'd all pick up their wares for the, the, the harvest. You know, it, was, it would last two or three months, when every, every couple of months when I stopped by. And, uh, and that's how I got my name. So some years later, after an arrest in upstate New York and getting off on an illegal search and seizure and moving into a hippie commune in St. Clair, Michigan, and, and uh, uh, shoot, I just had a brain fart. <laughs> so uh, they offered me a job at High Times Magazine, believe it or not. Yeah, this guy that was growing, you know, some of the best weed they ever had, they offered me a job at High Times Magazine. And would I be crazy to not take it or to take it? Well... I gave up growing. I took the job at High Times. And 
that's basically why I'm here. And it was definitely one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Um, High Times, in my eyes, is, a, is an icon. It's, it's kind of like, a, it's iconoclastic. It's a national icon. And uh, it's basically the reason why I'm here, without a doubt. And, and I, I just have to say that thanks to High Times, but more specifically cannabis, just about every person that I love this, to this day in my life, and there's a dozen of them in the audience right now, I met through cannabis. So I'm speaking to you, I have a career, I'm not in jail. <laughs> it's all because of cannabis. Thank you. So, uh, so after that arrest and everything, um, I moved to California. I did, I did five years as a staff journalist for High Times, and that was great, but, but for me, that was like living in the Brooklyn detention facility. For me, living in a city, it was hard. It was cool, rode a Vespa over to Brooklyn Bridge every day to work, and it was really cool. And you know, the, the, the coolest thing about it was I really kind of learned the skills that I'm using now. I didn't know that I could, that I was a public speaker or that I could do that. And uh, I wasn't an advocate when I started working at High Times. Um, so all of that came to me, and you know, this life found me, and again, it come, brings me back to appreciation. You know, appreciation for the situation we're all in, rather than the appreciation we might have been in, or for the situation we may have been in 20 years ago. And, uh, and that's why I like to tell everybody, I choose to live in the light. You know, there's a lot of darkness, and there's a lot of things that you can think about, and maybe legalization isn't perfect, but it is good. And legalization, I got to tell you, legalization is a sacrifice. At least that's how it feels to me. And that's how it feels to a lot of the people that I've loved over the years that I've been in California. Um, they don't all, the people that sacrifice don't all think of it as a good thing like I do. I'm talking about the people who made a living supplementing their income. Maybe put one child through college and now they can't put the second child through college. You know, there are really serious ramifications to legalization. The good side is we're putting far less people in jail, a lot more people have access to medicine, and, and we're right, cannabis needs to be legalized. So, you know, and another distinction that I want to bring up to everybody is, is that um, commercialization is not legalization. And a lot of what we have going on right now uh, seems to me to be the commercialization of a plant that I revere, that has given me love and life and friendship and health and wisdom. And um, so while I don't want to harsh on the commercial industry, I don't want to harsh on anybody's capitalistic intent or prosperity or anything like that, I just want to pose a question. Why can't legalization coexist side by side with commercialization? Why does there seem to be this big old fear about just unleashing legalization, but it's okay to make millions and millions and millions of dollars in these huge facilities that are run by state? you know, state-owned facilities and such. In California, we have the right idea. We're never going to get rid of home growing. I know that for a fact. We'll never let that happen. And one of the things that I want to make sure that I keep speaking about in years to come um, as we're continuing to fight for, for full legalization and federal legalization is the rights of the home grower. The rights of the people to grow their own weed, to be little Kyle Cushmans, you know? I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't know I wanted to be an advocate and a big public speaker and, and do all this and everything. I just knew I wanted to grow my own weed. And I knew that I enriched the people's lives around me. People loved me sometimes just because I grew weed. And I don't mean that in the worst way. I mean it in the best way. You know, appreciation.
you know, for a skill that sometimes other people's don't, people don't have. And, and, and all of those things that I mentioned should be available to anybody who wants to nourish their own soul or nourish or uh, uh, alleviate symptoms of an aunt or a grandmother or their wife whether it's a dystrophy or a Crohn's or, or autism or whatever it is. So remember as we're out there and we're enjoying our California liber freedoms, um, everybody else doesn't even haggle, have legalization and they're still haggling about these things and they're discussing these things. So everybody remember grower, home grower rights, please. It's really, really important. You know, We, I feel like, I feel like in my life, I've gone from televisions with no remote controls to, you know, from, from gardens where just recently, a few years back in these underground warehouses we used to have, where you had to drag around these 150-gallon reservoirs and drag it over to the washing area and do all these crazy manual labor. And now we have these automated irrigation and greenhouses that measure the micromoles and only feed in the parts per million depending on how much sun you got. And man, growing is really easy now. I'm just kidding, of course. That's part of the problem, honestly, is that people, the neighbors of the growers, everybody thinks once you set up a pot farm, you're going to be rich. And, you know, farming marijuana is like farming anything else. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of diligence. Um, but we're not out of the woods, and I want to mention a good friend of mine. Uh, give me a little ho hoot or a howl if you ever heard of Subcool. My good friend Subcool... Um, he's done a lot of good things for a lot of people over the years. He's been a, 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 a person who's gr grown gardens and donated the whole things and uh, donated money for autism. And uh, he just got arrested in Arizona. He was growing legally. The cops came to his house, just like the old days. Machine guns in hand, kicked the door down, ripped everything apart, took his computers, took his High Times Awards, his Lifetime Achievement Awards, took everything. You know, and, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm looking for donations. I'm saying this because I love him, and he's a brother of mine, and I want other people to have him in his, in his, in his mind and in his heart, and to remind us that, you know, <laughs> this fight ain't done yet. You know, I wish it was, but it's not. So my goal is to make sure that home growers maintain their rights, and I'm always going to make sure that I inform people how to grow their own weed. You know, that's the least I can do. I, I, I said to myself a long time ago, as long as I take care of the cannabis culture, the cannabis culture will take care of me. And you guys are doing a great job. And along with that, um, I guess I just want to leave you guys with, uh, with this thought. Marijuana is turning into a business right now. And... Uh, and that's good. That's not bad. Um, Steve D'Angelo told me, you know, a little bit about, you know, how he got, why he got, and why he brought in big in interest. And, like, it's a sacrifice. And so I don't want everybody to make a sacrifice, but I, what I want you to realize is that collaboration is key. I know it sounds kind of corny, but we're all looking for partners right now. And I see a lot of really chill faces in the audience. And as much as we all want to partner up with the big corporation, I tried that, and I ended up in a divorce. But what I'm really getting at in a long roundabout way is the more real estate that we can gobble up as entrepreneurs of the culture, the less real estate there is for Monsanto. I mean, just to put it bluntly, you know? And, 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 and don't worry about them. Don't, 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 don't walk around carrying billboards saying, fuck Monsanto, you know, or, don't waste your time. You know, they're going to do their thing no matter what you do. What I'm saying is choose to live in the light, you know, and, uh, and inspire others to do so. And that's basically all I got is like, you know, 
Like I said, I jokingly call my, refer to myself as a glorified high school bot, pot dealer. And if I hadn't have walked into that head shop and shared a joint with that guy and met high times, I certainly would not be standing here. I certainly would not have met my lovely wife. And all of the friends whom I've invited here, I wouldn't have met any of you either. So thank you all for coming. Keep, keep supporting the movement in any way you can. I love you very much. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you so much, Kyle. So uh, Kyle has been somebody that I've been watching for pretty much my entire career in cannabis. Um, and I, I'd probably say even before that, I, I want to say him and Ed Rosenthal kind of have the original what do I do with this plant questions on the internet for me. So thank you, Kyle, for helping uh, a, a really, really bad green thumb figure out how to try to grow some weed in her closet once. So <laughs> home everyone, thank you. Um, we're really, really thankful for Kyle and his uh, coming out here. He's very much a depiction of what, what's happening in this industry right now, right? Kyle just told us, hey, I tried to get this corporate, corporate opportunity and he ended up in a, a professional divorce. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's happening a lot right now. And that's really what Blunt Talks is all about, is to bring the industry together so less and less that kind of crap is happening to each and every one of you. Um, we're hoping to kind of bridge that gap, hoping to bring the mainstream of the industry and bring it to the culture so that we don't lose what we've worked so hard for. And, and in a big way, I'd say Weed Maps is a, uh, personif or a, a business personification of what that conversation is, right? We're having this like interesting battle like, who's supposed to be here right now, right? And the only answer I know is weed. The only answer I know for sure of who's actually supposed to be here right now is Mary Jane, this plant. And it's really up to each and every one of us to, to find it in ourselves to bring that connection together. It's up to us to evolve and mature, but it's also up to each and every one of the people in here for the business industry to understand the blood, sweat, and tears that was put into this um, meditation, and I probably don't usually start meditation with shut the fuck up, but I do. Uh, right, so what we're going to do is we are going to welcome in somebody very important to me. Um, I met April at a time in my life. Miss April Black was uh, a light for the cannabis industry. She was probably one of the more welcoming women I met at that time. Um, and and I, I feel like the industry is getting better, but at that point, I think I met her in 2015, and I, the girls were ready to claw each other's eyes out. Um, and I was running for Miss High Times. I am Miss March 2015. Thank you, thank you. I've got a, another Miss High Times, Dion, in the audience. Actually, I think there's like three or four girls um, out here in the audience right now that are Miss High Times, not him. Uh, he raised his hand. He is not a Miss High Times. Um, but with that, I wanted to win this beauty pageant, essentially, so freaking bad. And, you know, I was running a company. I was doing all these things, doing work with the Weed for Warriors. And I took second runner up. I was so sad. But somebody named April Black slid into the DMs and said, you know what, Nicole, you're meant for something greater. And don't let this get you down. This is just a pageant. And your life is so much more than this moment here. This moment is fleeting. And so for me, I got an opportunity to reflect on myself uh, right then and, and this very weird idea that I thought I needed to win a beauty pageant to be important. And I'm thankful for Miss April Black for letting me know that it's here. The beauty is right here. And no matter where we end up in the world, I'll always have that Miss High Times alumni, but I I'm, I'm my own Miss High Times every day. And yes, so April Black, she became a certified yoga instructor in 2004 and worked uh, as activities director at the resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. She moved to New York in 2008 and began working at CS Travel as the primary travel coordinator for the cannabis, in cannabis cups in Amsterdam. She moved to California in 2016 and founded her own travel agency, Higher Way Travel, which organizes events around the world that combine travel, cannabis, and wellness. And with that, I would like to leave it up to Miss April. Allow for us to take a moment of zen. So, if anybody in the room could please be quiet. 
it, and, and then we're going to be quiet. Miss April Black. Hello, hello, hello. All right, time to bring the vibe down a little bit. How many of you in this room right now have things on their to-do list that needed to be accomplished yesterday? Yep, 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 and yep. But what do we do? We fill our schedules up with work, with family, with kids and their schedules and driving around and getting stuck in traffic, all that stuff. And when that happens, we kind of get off balance. We kind of get irritable. We don't get enough sleep. And so what we really need to do is focus on self-care. Now, self-care isn't something that only involves bubble baths, which often comes to mind, and massages. Very true, very relaxing, but not the only component of self-care. And of course, yoga, very important and often uh, gone to thing for self-care. But some other things that are, you don't usually think about for self-care, like going to bed an hour earlier, uh, cooking at home instead of ordering out all the time, you can cook with your family, you're spending time with your family, and you're cooking something healthier. And meditation. Now, a lot of people don't meditate because they say they can't meditate. And they say they can't meditate because they can't sit still. They can't calm their mind. All the thoughts come flooding in their mind and they swing from thought to thought to thought like a monkey in a tree, which is called the drunken monkey mind. And it happens to all of us. But I just want to let you know that meditation does not always have to be a still practice. So whether or not you already have some of these self-care uh, things in place in your life, maybe you go to the gym, you do yoga, you read to your kids, you go for walks in nature, you walk your dogs, all those things. With an intention set behind that, that can turn into your moving meditation. We spend so much time in our heads. We spend so much time on our devices all the time. Do, 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 do. And we just get disconnected from the body. So, just slow the body down. I call meditation a self care power tool. So, if you'll join me in this meditation, it won't take very long, but I promise you'll feel very good. We're going to focus on the breath, which is something that we all have in here. And think about it, we breathe all day long. How much are we utilizing that lung capacity besides smoking weed? True. So, we're going to get into that breath, let that air out. Be thankful we get to take another breath in. So, let's begin. All right, everybody. I'd like you to close your eyes and plant both feet on the floor. Even for you guys standing in the back, just plant both feet on the floor. Find a comfortable position. Sit up tall. If you're sitting, Feel your sits bones on the chair. Open your chest. Place your palms on your hands, on your thighs. Place them on your belly. Take a big inhalation. Hold at the top. And release that breath nice and slow. Again, inhale. Imagine that you're breathing into the back of your back, your upper back, and let that breath go. Slowly exhale. I want you to continue breathing at your own pace. Relax your temples. Relax your jaw. Peel your tongue from the roof of your mouth. Notice that thoughts will come. There's noise all around you. Observe. 
and, ab and let it go. Repeat this mantra to yourself in your mind. I am present now. Inhale. Bring your shoulders up to your ears and squeeze. Roll those shoulders back, releasing, finding that length between your shoulders and your ears. And again, inhale, bring those shoulders up to your ears. And exhale, just finding that length. Inhale, take that nice big breath, hold at the top. Feel the movement of the belly, the expansion of your ribs, the expansion of your chest. Inhale, repeat to yourself, I am present now. Exhale. Inhale, the biggest breath yet. Take that breath in. And exhale, letting it all go. Inhale, one more big breath. Fill up all the way. And exhale, letting that breath go. Coming back to the body. Wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes. Gently rock your head from side to side. How does your body feel right now? Bring your palms together in front of your heart center. And slowly open your eyes. Thank you for meditating with me tonight. Namaste. <laughs> oh! A little too quick. Thank you. So now we're going to do something um, a little bit different. Um, with our next speaker, we're actually going to have kind of like a fireside chat. Um, we're going to ask him a few, uh, a few questions, and we have this awesome fire here. So it's fireside. <laughs> But um, our next speaker is someone that I actually met him a few years ago at a cannabis cup and um, I had no idea who he was. I just thought he had kind of funny looking glasses and I was wondering why everyone was like so attracted to this guy and wanted to be this guy's friend. Um, but when I met him, I realized it's because he's a really nice and cool guy. Um, but Jason Pinsky is the former chief cannabis evangelist at Ease. And he's the cannabis producer for Viceland's Bon Appetit, so he's the first credited cannabis producer on IMDb. Um, Pinsky is a prol prolific cannabis connoisseur starting in 1994 when he judged the first High Times Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam. In 2014, after a decade of opioid dependency due to a spinal in injury, Pinsky used cannabis to help wean himself off pain medication completely. His story and advocacy lead to his participation in the passing of New York State's Compassion Care Act, and in 2016, he helped expand the program to include chronic pain as a qualifying condition. Pinsky has also worked as a chief technical officer, held multiple high-level positions in the music industry, such as technology manager for Fish, and has even been a founding partner in a Zagat number one rated restaurant. <laughs> That's insane. So, Without further ado, let's give it up for uh, Jason Pinsky. And this is also, a, this is another person that, um, let's, give it, let's give it up again because it actually took us about three years to get him to come and speak. So let's give him another round of applause. So uh, greetings. Greetings, thank you for the intro, of Sam. Of course, of course. Uh, amazing to be here. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, it's a true story, actually. Sam uh, had hit me up for uh, Blunt Talks and it wasn't until uh, Nicole West joined the team that I was like, all right, I'm in. Um, <laughs> so, true story. <laughs> let's get down to it. Uh, what do you think of the fireside chat, by the way? Pretty good, right? 
You like that's that? The, that's the, I don't know where that came from. It was Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. If it was you, thank you. But it, it, Nicole was like, she's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, let's do a fireside chat. She's like, you got to bring the fireside. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday she's like, uh, did you order it? You know, for Amazon. I was like, yeah, it's uh, supposed to arrive. Uh... So true story. This arrived around 4:45 today. Perfect timing. And uh, yeah, perfect timing. Let's give it so up for Amazon. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, okay, so first, um, there's something strong to be said about staying true, staying true to who you are, and I feel like you more than anyone can speak to that. Um, what would you say about people creating a brand or a business right now um, in regards to the importance of staying authentic? Well, I mean, there's so much bullshit out there. Uh, authenticity is really at the core of uh, my work. Um, I know that, um, you know, right now as cannabis turns into a commoditized industry, uh, brand building is really key. Uh, for me, I spent the first several years as I emerged into the public sphere, uh, 2014, um, really working on like my own brand. A lot of people didn't know who I was when I came on the scene. Uh, if you knew me from New York, then you knew me. But if you didn't know who I was, it was uh, definitely... Uh, from the traditional market. It was, yeah, the traditional market. Yeah, of course. Um, so what I would say to that is, um, you know, uh, we don't work for logos, right? Uh, it's all about building your team. Uh, your network is your net worth. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I chose to actually, like, work on my own personal brand. Um, and then, obviously, co-branding with Vice, uh, producing Bon Appetit, co-branding with Ease. Um, all of those things, I think, were important. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you really need to stay true to yourself. Um, and then especially as the market, you know, turns into a mainstream marketplace, um, all of those stories in terms of uh, origin stories and how this really came to be uh, are really important to be told. And uh, storytelling is obviously part of my whole wheelhouse. Definitely. You're great at it. Um, well, thank you for that. And um, <laughs> now moving on, just because, sorry, we don't have too much time, so I'm kind of speeding through these questions, but um, I'm sure you're aware uh, there's a rumor, that there's a, <laughs> there was a rumor that you were a cop <laughs> at one point. <laughs> and, I mean, um, I rolled into Denver in 2014. Uh, it was right at the, you know, beginning of, you know, the adult use marketplace. And I came hard, dude. I came on a Harley. I was at the Four Seasons. True story, I was banned from the Four Seasons for smoking weed with Boy George and the Culture Club. Um, but, um, you know, when you, when you roll hard, like, you know, the rumor is like, who is this dude? And, um, you know, my answer to that was the reason you don't know me was by design. Um, you know, being part of uh, the, the legacy of weed in New York, it was Sour Diesel, it was Chemdog, it was the Grateful Dead, it was Fish. You know, music and weed have always been a huge part of my wheelhouse. Um, but really, like, you know, I had to keep it low key. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, I embraced the, uh, the rumors um, and uh, just continued to push on harder. Uh, so, and do you remember, um, this isn't part of the script, but it just brings up something that I thought. Do you remember the turning point where you decided I want to go and go from being kind of in the traditional market in New York and behind the scenes to, well, okay, weed, I'm going to... Weed wasn't, wasn't really my full-time thing. I mean, the Pinsky Triangle was like technology is how I made my career, and then music and weed is how I connected the dots in terms of my passions. <laughs> um, but really, you know, it was, it was cannabis technology, then music technology, now music technology before that, um, and uh, really connecting the dots in terms of like, you know, my former careers. Uh, is certainly, uh, you know, led up to uh, how it happened today. But I think really the turning point for me was getting off opiates. Uh, I was on OxyContin for 15 years. I had spine surgery. I was on a deadly dose. I mean, if you had to, it was over 1,500 milligrams every 24 hours uh, by the time I got off. And in 2013, I made a decision that I wanted to lose 100 pounds to get 100% off opiates. And I actually really, you know, need to give it up again to high times. My first Cannabis Cup was in 94 in Amsterdam. I didn't return to the Cannabis Cup judging scene until 2014. And from 2014, uh, 2014 through 2015, I was, uh, I judged more concentrates uh, pretty much than anyone. They called me the Simon Cowell of concentrates because I was like the asshole judge from New York that was like, eh, 
fuck you, your shit sucks, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, but really judging those cannabis cups and getting access to these entries is what gave me access to the medication that got me uh, opiate free. So October 10th, uh, 2014, it's been five years that I've been uh, off pain medication. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So I'm now back to the script. Um, what was the original political push you were a part of back in New York? Can you well, elaborate? Well, this, this was what happened is, you know, like uh, if I think about, you know, my story, uh, I was one of the only guys that was part of Compassionate Care New York, which was part of the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, you know, I had, I went up to Albany. I went up to Buffalo. I attended the hearings. I testified in front of the closed uh, Senate hearings and was really part of getting uh, medical cannabis uh, legalized in 2014, but I couldn't really use my personal story until the law went into effect in 2016. In 2016, when the law went into effect, that's when the opiate epidemic was really starting to, you know, become firsthand. And I also had gotten off the pain meds. So I didn't feel like it was authentic, right, to your point, in 2014 to tell my story until I was actually like a year and change off the pain meds. So my work not only helped get cannabis legalized uh, for medical in New York, but then the work that I did also got chronic pain as a qualifying condition. And, um, and that was, uh, Vice covered that story as a patient story, which, uh, which led to my work on Bong Appetit uh, later that year. That's, thank you, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what do you think is the current state of affairs for cannabis businesses when it comes to like new business and new tech and technology? Well, I'm uh, recently a free agent. I've uh, ended my career with ease after two years. So if that answers your question a little bit about the state of affairs in the cannabis industry, it's tough out there right now. Um, you know, I was a, uh, uh, in the tech industry in the 90s and I watched the arc of how the technology industry and the stocks associated with it and having to continue to raise capital and the bubble eventually burst. And being part of the tech industry in the 90s gave me really interesting perspective in terms of the cannabis industry, being a pioneer in two movements that have really revolutionized humanity uh, has been certainly an interesting experience. So, you know, this is why, you know, building your brand and building your team is really kind of the most important thing right now because, you know, weed is going to turn into broccoli. At the end of the day, you know, in a commoditized market, you're going to find yourself where the product is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And um, if I can quote, uh, you know, the Pinsky Triangle of Trust, right, and there's many of them, but uh, patience, fortitude, and embracing change are really the core elements of trust, and trust is the core element of building any brand. So, you know, I'd say brand building right now is, is probably an important thing as the industry, um, you know, fluctuates, your brand still has an opportunity to really be front and center. I agree, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, and so, what do you think is the next wave of, um, like, hot shit in the cannabis industry? Is there anything that's, like, catching your attention right now that is new or any have you guys Have you guys seen the products from Fuego? Fuego? Fire? <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, you know, look, here's the thing. I've always been uh, more on the, t on the sides of uh, Terps, right? So, uh, you know, you, you, you may have met me uh, in public uh, putting uh, Terps on your stash, okay? And, uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, products that are, that are Terp-focused, uh, fragrance-focused, uh, I think that's really interesting, but, you know, I'm pretty much over cannabis and I'm moving on to psychedelics, I think, is really the next thing, so. <laughs> yeah. So are you currently doing anything within psychedelics, or you just know that's um, your next like move? Like and... currently, presently, or? Yeah, yeah. Uh... <laughs> I was big business wise. Um, well, you know, the business of psychedelics right now is really more of a media coverage type thing. I mean, entheogenic plants have been, you know, uh, decriminalized in, in two markets. Uh, I think it's really important when I think about psychedelics or when I think about compounds that come from plants, uh, compounds that are endogenous in our body, right? So, like, you know, really the bit, the, the, my psychedelic triangle would probably be cannabis, DMT, and uh, psilocybin. Um, 
And, and really, if you think about it, like, you know, especially when it comes to cannabis and, and dimethyltryptamine, right, these are compounds that exist in our bodies naturally, right? So, like, you know, I really view the cannabis story and the psychedelic story as um, dietary supplements. These are nutrients. So with weed, it's about uh, balance. It's about uh, the endocannabinoid system is about, is about uh, maintaining chemical balance and really getting your body to that point. And once we've gotten our bodies to that point of balance, then it's time for other um, nutrients that could really expand our consciousness. So I think it has to come in that order, and I think the cannabis movement is a really good path toward uh, the psychedelic movement and the psychedelic industry uh, that's coming upon us. So get ready for that and stay tuned. Well, thank you, Pinsky. And um, I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. I'm out of questions on my list. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Yeah. Of course you may. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for your story. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. Um, my question is, when you started using concentrates and had access to that, was that the first time you tried something so strong, which is what gave you that medical relief? So the, it's actually interesting that you bring that up because I had been smoking weed since I'm 13, right? It's, it's like a rite of passage for every young Jewish boy in New York to sneak out into the parking lot in your bar mitzvah and go smoke a joint with your friends, right? And, um, you know, really it's, uh, it's interesting because my entire experience on OxyContin was using flour. And it wasn't until the uh, concentrates and the advanced formulations really started to become a thing that I started to see it having a therapeutic effect. And, you know, it's no question that smoking a joint gets you high, but when you're, you know, doing high temperature dabs, which is, was the rage in 2013-14, right, um, it really did give me more of a, uh, a medically appropriate dose. Um, and then also judging the cannabis cups, I mean, dude, High Times was giving me like 60 entries, two grams a piece every other month. You know, so like I was like, you know, somehow I would wind up in New York with like a quarter pound of like award winning hash. And I, I really have to credit that experience of judging uh, to have really bridged the gap in terms of uh, getting me from, you know, just smoking flour and having that get me high to using concentrates and having that really have a more therapeutic impact. So great question. Thank you. And last question from my man Eugenio from Cannabis Now magazine. Hey, Jason. Thank Greetings. you for being here. Hello. So we just got done eating at the Lowell's Cafe okay. here in L.A. And um, given your heritage and having one of the best barbecue spots on planet Earth and Bon Appetit, I'd love to hear your reflections on the past, present, and future of cannabis and food. Well, I think I commented on it a little bit. You know, I mean, like, you know, one of the things that we did on Bon Appetit that was really very unique was we weren't really just trying to use uh, cannabis butter, uh, we weren't trying to do traditional home extractions. We were taking advantage um, of, uh, of a lot of the uh, different products that come out of labs with uh, isolating the um, cannabinoids, the terpenes, and using those, um, you know, sometimes in a non-psychoactive way, sometimes in a flavor-forward way. So I think that um, really if you think of uh, cannabis as just another ingredient, uh, I think that's really the future. And, uh, and, and that's a lot of what we tried to do. Shout out to uh, Rye Pritchard in the audience here tonight. Rye was uh, one of the masterminds uh, behind the show and was our cannabis expert on the air. And, um, you know, it really took an entire team of us to, to kind of come up with things creatively. But, you know, I think to answer your question, I love that food forward is really starting to become the thing. Uh, people typically sometimes have an experience with edibles where it's um, not always a pleasurable experience. So, you know, my, my advice in terms of using weed as an ingredient in food is not to only think of it uh, from a psychoactive intention, but really to think of it, you know, just as another ingredient for flavor, fragrance, or enhancement. Thank you so much, Pinsky. We Thank you, everybody, you. for coming tonight. Big round of applause to the Blunt Talks guys as well. Oh yeah, the fire. I'll just unplug it. I'll unplug this. The fire has it.
Oh, this is true. Is this my business card? Oh, no, that's Sam's business card. If anybody wants Sam's contact, it's right there. Uh, so thank you. Pinsky is actually one of my dearest friends, and I was so excited for him to come speak. I actually had no idea that Sam was trying to get her for a while, and we were able to get him here. Uh, it only took a little... Hello, hello, I'm back, okay. It only took a little coercing for us to get Pinsky here. I only had to remind him 25 times to fill out his paperwork and follow up with him today and see if he ordered the fire that he was supposed to bring, thank goodness. We need to get Pinsky an assistant, that's what I think needs to happen. But with that, we're about to roll into probably what I am the most excited about tonight, and no offense to every other speaker, but the next speaker is actually my mentor. Um, her name is Ariel Clark. I was fortunate enough to meet Ariel last year at a expo in Los Angeles, where I was moderating a legal panel of four amazing lawyers that did not know that I was facing felony criminal charges against myself for marijuana. Um, I got an opportunity to meet these people that I wanted to hug and scream and beg for information because I needed to talk about it, but I couldn't let everybody know that we were being investigated with a, a full-fledged grand jury at the time. So it took me a year of developing a friendship with Ariel before I was able to reach out and ask her to actually mentor me. I've always had a very strong passion for people that are so good and in love with the things that they're doing that it literally burns through them. And Ariel is one of those people. She is one of California's best known and longest serving cannabis business attorneys. Ariel advises cannabis, hemp, and CBD companies in all aspects of business transactional matters. Ariel has earned her Juris Doctorate degree from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and was awarded a Bachelor of Arts with honors at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Hey guys, if you're in the back, my mentor is about to speak and I'm really excited about her speaking. So if everybody could just quiet down if you're inside. Hey, if we could quiet down if we're inside, it would be really awesome. I don't want to have to shush you while my mentor's speaking. Thank you. With that said, Ariel has always inspired me to let me know that, you know, if you do what you love, the money will find its way. So today I smoked two ounces of weed, I played with my dog, and I took three naps. I'm going to wait for the money now. Ariel, we would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you to the entire Blood Talks crew. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Everyone, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk about mentorship, why it matters, what is mentorship, and how it's impacted my own life. Um, I've understood the idea of mentorship conceptually for my entire life, but only in the last couple of years since I've engaged in formalized mentor relationships as a mentor and a mentee have I seen the enormous benefits that can bring, and that's what I want to encourage every one of you here tonight to do and explore if you haven't been involved in a mentor re relationship. So being on planet Earth is wild. It is crazy. There is so much to sort through, so much to do, so much to learn, so much to learn that we need to unlearn. It is not easy being a human. So how do we navigate it all? We learn by standing on the shoulders of the ones who have come before us and the ones who are living alongside us. Those are our elders in spiritual contexts, our elders in our families. Um, they are our teachers that we meet K through 12 in other contexts. They're also youth. We learn so much from young people how to approach life and maybe how to play. So there are mentors everywhere, all around us, and we have the benefit of all of that teaching throughout our lifetime. Someone who provides support and is a cheerleader. So I pulled a, a couple quotes that I like a lot about mentorship. Mentoring is a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. A mentor is someone who sees more talent and ability in you than you see in yourself. Okay. In order to mentor, 
And to be an effective one, one must care. Know what you know and care about the person and care about what you know and care about the person you're sharing it with. And you know what I would add is be vulnerable. Tell your real story, whether you're the mentor or the mentee. Talk about your wins and your losses because it's really how we walk through the fire in the hardest times in our life that we are made. And we learn so much from people who have walked through that fire. How did they do that? So tell the truth. Why does mentorship matter? So let me tell you, in preparation for this evening's talk, I did a lot of research because I'm a lawyer and a nerd. And uh, I read many studies about the benefits of mentorship. Countless studies talk about statistically that mentorship helps young people, K through 12. There's less high school dropout rates. They're more engaged with their community. They have more connection to what they are learning. The same is true in college, in grad school. It goes into the workplace. People who are mentored in the workplace tend to have higher salaries, better feelings about their job. There's better job retention. Um, you know, and it's so valuable that 71% of Fortune 500 companies have actual formalized mentorship programs within their companies. It works. Oh, also, mentorship, it creates a support system. You have an accountability partner. You have someone who will show up with you and help you achieve your goals. Plus, as human beings, we want happiness, don't we? And a lot of that comes from connection and not being in isolation. So when we have that mentorship relationship, we are connecting with another being. Okay, so this is the part where I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own personal journey. I was born in Michigan. My mother is of French European descent. My father is full blood Native American, Ottawa from the Grand, Grand Traverse Band of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Um, both of my parents were definitely on the fringes in society. He also had a third grade education and he was a professor there. 